Hello, my name is Claire Simpson, and I'm a remote sensing specialist at the Geospatial Technology and Applications Center, or GTAC, in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'll be presenting on a few digital soil mapping projects in the Western US. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the collaborators for each of these projects. So what is digital soil mapping, or DSM? Digital soil mapping represents a framework for spatially predicting and mapping soils that is more statistically driven than traditional soil modeling. It is scalable, so you can use it on a local or large national scale projects. It is flexible in that you can incorporate various spatial data set types alongside expert knowledge. Um, and one last benefit of DSM work that I'll mention is that it incorporates metrics of uncertainty and has accuracy assessment as um, part of the workflow. So here's a graphic that depicts how the DSM framework integrates field data, geospatial covariate layers, such as elevation or climate, um, expert opinion, and models to ultimately produce the final output soil map. And I really want to highlight the left side of the figure because sample design is an important part of DSM work. Getting enough representative sample points to use to train a model is one of the biggest operational challenges we face. So I'll dedicate much of this presentation to discussing some of the quantitative methods we've used for sample designs. And here's a map showing the four DSM projects I'll touch on in this presentation. All of these are multi-year projects and are in various stages of development. I'll first go over the Bob Marshall project as this is the furthest along and it served as a template for many of these subsequent DSM projects. And then I'll go through some additional methodologies we've employed to solve other DSM challenges um, during the subsequent three projects. So now I'll go, go over the DSM work we've been doing on the Bob Marshall, and this will serve to illustrate a typical DSM workflow. Here's a bit of background on the Bob Marshall. It's a large area in northwestern Montana, and the terrain is highly variable and dynamic. And as it's a wilderness area, there aren't many roads, making it difficult to access. The sample points we've collected here so far have primarily been accessed by hiking. So the main challenge here is how do we collect enough diverse sample points around our study area to create a soil map? So one popular tool to use in DSM work is CLHS, or Constrained Latin Hypercube Sampling. And the purpose of this algorithm is to generate a specified number of sample points with the aim of capturing multidimensional variability across the data space while minimizing location dependent cost. So breaking that down a bit, we're trying to obtain n number of samples and we want those samples to be distributed across that data space. So for example, we want these points to capture the full range of elevation values across the sample AOI. And the cost constraint part of this serves to condense the samples into areas that are easier for us to access without completely eliminating potentially unique areas. So for the bob, we defined cost by distance from a trailhead, a cabin, or a trail. And then additionally, um, we ended up removing areas that were greater than a half mile from the trail. And that's what this figure is showing. This is like a heat map of cost where the red shows the accessible areas for denser sampling and the blue represents high cost areas or areas that are more difficult to access. Another tactic we used on the Bob was similarity buffers and field maps. And these can help folks in the field find areas to sample that are similar to the target point in the event that the exact site is not accessible for whatever reason. So this figure is an example of a map I created for a point on the bob, and the upper panel shows a similarity heat map where red areas are going to be the most similar. And the metric of similarity here is the Gowers index, which is a measurement of relative similarity. And as far as the modeling, we use random forests. Um, and in the case of the bob, we're trying to predict categorical soil classes that were defined by vegetation type, landform, geology, um, and some other features. So here's a broad look at the steps to take when modeling. These are pretty generalized to any model, but I just wanna highlight one of the ancillary methods we used, which is called recursive feature elimination. And this helps us hone in on the best predictors for our model, so we can simplify the model um, and reduce the number of inputs. And this can be helpful for reducing the computational load or model runtime. And it also helps us reduce unnecessary information because ultimately redundant or correlated variables aren't really gonna improve our model. And here's a list of preliminary challenges for this project. A familiar challenge to anyone who's worked with remote sensing data is the limitations on spatial resolution. 
which means you're representing a, a feature at potentially a much lower resolution than the variability of that feature on the ground. Um, I'll also emphasize here that it's hard to capture a balanced training data set. And by that, I mean get approximately equal numbers of sample points for each of your target classes. But attaining this balance is actually really important. Um, and currently, we're unable to get a super accurate uh, soil model for the bob because we have too few data points in many of our target classes. Um, this is definitely something we're considering as we're preparing for our next field season. So now I'll discuss the pay app project and it follows a very similar workflow to the Bob. So I'll instead focus on some techniques we use to improve our sample design. So in contrast to the Bob Marshall, there are lots of roads as well as some airstrips on the payette. So access, access isn't as much of an issue and we can use this fact in our sampling AOI by limiting the study area to within three and a half kilometers of roads, for example. Um, because the road network allows us to access so much area, we don't necessarily have to be concerned that clipping the AOI to within some distance of roads will remove uh, any important variability or soil types from the area we're considering for sampling. And this also means we can be a bit pickier about trail access areas uh, and reduce the amount of hiking needed to visit points. All right, so the first technique I'll discuss is seeding, which is super simple. It can help cluster your sample points to make them all easier to visit. And so for the payette, Brian Gardner, who is helping lead this work, sort of knew where he'd start field visits from. Um, so I could place seeds there and essentially encourage denser sampling around these seeds. And the way this is actually implemented is through that cost parameter within CLHS. So you can assign much lower cost values to areas within some buffer distance of a seed. And you can see how that played out in this figure, which shows a heat map of sample point density. And so the redder or denser areas are around the seeds we set. In the payette, we wanted to add points to an existing data set. And so one easy way to do this is actually within the CLHS algorithm. You can tell the model to pre-select certain points within your data space using this include parameter and it will then continue sampling while accounting for the information you've already gathered so it's really building on the existing data set in a statistical way so onto the ashley national forest there are a few more tricks we used here that i wanted to go over and as a quick background the ashley's in utah it's a few hours east of where i am in salt lake city um, and the road access is fairly similar to the payette so I wanted to mention certain considerations in the Ashley, because as with any project, there are different environmental factors that might be important, as well as different business needs. So for this project, we're focusing on Forest Service managed land in the Ashley, and there's some priority areas, uh, namely rangeland and non-wilderness areas that we'd like to focus our uh, sampling on and get the most accurate data here so we can ultimately have uh, more accurate soil maps. And the previous slide listed site sensitivity. And just to touch on that, uh, an issue we have on the Ashley's, a number of our initial target samples are located on potentially sensitive areas, and we won't necessarily know if we can visit these sites until an archaeological crew can go survey those areas. However, fortunately, there are mitigation methods, and I'll focus on the middle point as this is what we would decide to try. So we used a similarity metric, cosine similarity, uh, which was run on our environmental covariate stack to find the single most similar pixel for each of our sensitive target sites. And this alternative point had to be on areas of the forest that had already been surveyed. Um, so this can help us ensure that if our initial points are in sensitive locations or don't get surveyed in time, we have a set of backup alternative targets. And I'll also quickly mention that this third solution is something we did try on the Payette National Forest uh, to generally help combat point inaccessibility and just provide more flexibility. So for example, these points could help relocate a target sample to a place closer to where you would actually be going out in the field. And as I've mentioned, uh, it's very important to have balanced training data as this really affects model accuracy down the road. So for the Ashley, we decided to explicitly stratify CLHS. And in this first season, we're planning to collect 15 points per land type. Uh, in the next season, we'll try to obtain more area weighted points per land type. And this is just another way to go beyond CLHS. And we aren't yet sure whether this stratification will help or if we'll end up oversampling some of the soil types that are on land types with less variability. But we have a few field seasons um, during which we'll collect sample data. So we're testing it out this year. 
So to reiterate some of our methods and lessons learned from these projects, uh, to point one, constrain your sampling AOI. It's really important. Um, constraining it to places you'll actually realistically be able to visit um, and considering if you have any priority areas or any unique opportunities or limitations in your AOI. You can always evaluate the data space in your constrained AOI relative to the whole forest to ensure you're considering enough variable terrain. And the second point refers to the fact that CLHS points should be taken as a set. So the intention here is to collect all of the CLHS points you've generated in order to capture all of the environmental variability. There's really nothing special about any individual points and sometimes a point can be located in a fairly illogical place for sampling. But it's important to remember that the value of CLHS lies in the final set of samples, not any individual point. And in practice, that's not to say you actually need to capture every single point and emit all ad hoc sampling, because it's probably not super realistic, and ultimately you want as much training data as possible. The caveat to that point, though, is the third bullet. You do want to have uh, approximately balanced data for modeling. And these last points just reiterate some of the methods we've used to help improve sample designs. So at GTAC, we are planning a few tools to improve DSM work and access to DSM workflows. I'm currently the TUI Toolkit Administrator. Um, this toolkit is a collection of geospatial tools, and we are currently trying to redesign the toolkit and add a lot more functionality. And one of the primary aims of this redesign is to keep up with current DSM methods and make the tool necessary for DSM work available to folks in a user interface um, and try to eliminate the need for specialized programming skills. And the second point has to do with solving one of the more time consuming parts of the DSM pipeline. And I'll speak specifically in reference uh, to the DSM work we've been doing on the salmon chalice. So for the salmon chalice project, GTAC needed to create over 60 derivatives as it wasn't clear which layers would be most important to modeling soils. Um, but creating these layers is really time consuming and it requires lots of computing resources. So in the future, we are hoping to test out running correlations and testing models with any existing data where it's available on smaller subset AOIs within the project uh, within Google Earth Engine. And the reason for this is that correlated derivatives don't usually add much to a model and therefore it won't be worth uh, producing. And so this could really help speeding up uh, the processing aspect of DSM work. So thank you all for listening and please feel free to reach out with any questions.